So my name is Niran Babalola. Uh, I've been working in the Ethereum ecosystem since uh, 2015. Uh, so I've uh, worked on a variety of projects. I worked on Augur, then I joined Consensus later that year, worked on Gnosis, uh, did some security auditing with Consensus Diligence, and then launched uh, Panvala in, uh, uh, founded Panvala in mid-2018, launched it in August of 2019, so almost a year ago now. Uh, since the beginning of the year, Panvala has been an independent project that's trying to demonstrate to the Ethereum community how this economic system can work and how we can use it to subsidize our communities. Uh, so next, how about Sky? Yeah, hey, hey everyone, I'm Sky. Uh, I've been in the Ethereum space for a few years now. Um, currently, I, I'm working at White Block, which focuses on white blo uh, blockchain testing but I'm also spent a lot of time in the DAO world. So uh, uh, Meta Cartel a little bit and DX DAO and uh, was part of the uh, DX DAO cluster representative as part of this last round. Next, uh, Noah, how about Noah? All right, thanks. Um, hi, I'm Noah. I'm a software engineer out of Austin, Texas. Um, I write web pages, so uh, I, I am just here to literally be oriented and uh, figure out how this works. Neuron has been bending my ear about um, blockchain technology for public good for like 10 years now at this point, I think. So this is, this is, my, this is my chance to <laughs> get, get his perspective on it. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Um, Marco, you're the next one down the list. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Marco. I'm a product designer from Croatia. Uh, I've been in the Ethereum space for several years ago as well. In the blockchain space, I think from since 2012, 2013 or something like that. I uh, spent a lot of time in consultancies, digital agencies. Um, I've also been at Consensus as design principal. That's where I found about Panvala and, and Niran and the project itself. I've uh, been, I'm, I'm contributing to the Ethereum's, Ethereum community and a lot of projects uh, like uh, Givet, Pamvala, Meta Cartel, Meta Game. I'm also a member of Riot Guild. Uh, I'm also into the DAOs and Aragon, basically all over the place. Um, so yeah, that's it. I'm here to, as well, to be oriented for the, for the Pamvala this, um, this summer orientation. So yeah, looking forward to that. And I pass it on to, okay, Willie. Because I know you. <laughs> Thanks, Marco. Marco is a badass product designer. For if anyone doesn't know, I can definitely attest to that. My name is Willie. I'm currently senior product manager at Shapeshift. I did two startups before. One legal tech. Uh, it's called Just Legal. It's actually in Austin. I got acquired in 2017, and then started Bitfract, which Shapeshift acquired in 2018. Um, I've been working with Givet since uh, ETH Denver this past year when we did a, a public good blockchain project cause, and then met Griff. And United to start working on Give It Two, which is coming together really well. We're making really good progress on our MVP and hoping to launch it in the next couple months. And um, yeah, so we also Give It ended up raising quite a bit of uh, funds through the Panvala uh, matching round this past round through Gitcoin, more than more than we meant to. So I think we're feeling a little bit guilty. And we want to one thing we want to do is figure out a way we can give some of this Panvala back to the community. So that's one reason I'm here. And then we're also I, I we're interested in potentially working with Panvala to be. Uh, like an application where people can find projects to donate pan to. So I think it's a cool concept and interested in learning more about Panvala. And I will pass it to Christopher. Hey, I'm Chris. I'm just a regular engineer. I work at Condé Nast. Uh, I'm very new to, I would say my knowledge is like near zero for a lot of this, uh, like a blockchain based technologies. I know a lot of the terminology, but not a lot of the application or the lingo. So I'm very interested. I'm very much here to get oriented as well. Uh, I don't see any other people on video, so I'm not sure who to pass it off on to. How about Jason? Hey guys, can you see me? Um, yeah, so I'm Jason. I'm currently uh, focusing on building a project called Wildcards. Um, it's a project that connects people all around the world who are passionate about wildlife conservation. And um, it's the world's first wildlife DAO, which is super exciting. But 
effectively it's a fun and engaging way for people um, globally to contribute to wildlife conservation directly um, no matter where that organization is or um, you know uh, what the organization uh, sort of structure is you can um, you can contribute to to the organizations that you feel are having a, a big impact so um, hopefully there can be some synergies with Pandvala, which I'm really excited about. Uh, yeah, who should I pass on to? Uh, does it need to be someone with a camera on? I didn't, maybe you, you pass it on for me. I'll do it. Uh, how about Haley? Hello all, my name is Haley Summers. I'm currently located in Reno, Nevada. I've been hanging out in the Ethereum space heavily since about 2017. Launched a non-fungible token DAP on Ethereum in 2018, Mokens.io. Used a, um, we'll call it a predecessor or competitor to 1155. Um, it used 998 as a composable token standards. Used to be the uh, community manager for the Ethereum uh, Nifty Magicians. Uh, last year, I was employed by Blockchains LLC here in Nevada, uh, that co crazy company that bought all that land in northern Nevada. I was a lobbyist who did product compliance for them as well. And um, I've also taught civic education for the last 10 years, and I'm currently employed at the university doing civic education work. So I'm here on this call today because this is a new space uh, right on par with some of the um, blockchain for good consensus applications. Um, a lot of here people here from Giveth, which is really cool, and that's exactly why I'm here. I'm excited to be as uh, part of this blockchain for good movement here. Awesome. And in the interest of time, just one more introduction. So, how about for the last one, Simon? Cool. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Simon Delarvier. I've been in the blockchain space for a few years. Uh, I've always been interested in token economics and ways in which we can self-organize to towards shared goals. And the reason why I'm here is because uh, I think Benvala is one of those uh, experiments that are the most important ones. Uh, and uh, I want to support it where I can. So, uh, yeah, that's me. Awesome. All right. I'm going to turn back on my video. Uh, if it's just cutting out, let me know so I can that and then bandwidth will be conserved. Uh, so let me share my screen once again. All right, uh, so uh, for this orientation, I want to go through a couple of things, an overview of how Panvala works, uh, what the PAN token is and how that fits into the system, how that works, uh, where the matching actually come from because it sounds like some sort of magical system who's actually giving the money I want to explain how that happens uh, explain the system and the Panvala League uh, how we've had these five communities come together to earn donation matching from the system uh, how people can exchange the pantones or getting this uh, token for the work that they want to do and some of them need to sell tokens to find work and pay their bills and lastly, how to get involved and be aware of what's going on in Panball. Uh, I'll stop a couple of times during the meeting for questions, I think, uh, and I'm running short on time. And uh, definitely, like, a, a big part of having this be a live thing where you can be here is to make sure your questions get answered. Uh, so really excited to answer questions from you guys. Niran, is breaking up a like, slightly. If you, you, you probably don't need your video on as long as we can see and hear you, see the presentation. Right. I can hear you. All right, let me know uh, if it sounds better like this. Yeah, that's better. All right, I need to fix my bandwidth stuff. Uh, but uh, so the general idea with Panvala is that we're trying to create a system where holders are philanthropists. So uh, we're really taking a lot of inspiration from the Bitcoin model. Uh, in Bitcoin, the network subsidizes its own security by creating new Bitcoins. It's not the users of the network who are making Bitcoin go. It's the people who hold on to the Bitcoin and allow themselves to be diluted uh, so that the new Bitcoins can fund the miners. That's really what's making most of the network go. Uh, so with Panvala, we want to generalize the economics to subsidize whatever we want. We, we want to subsidize what's going on in different communities uh, to be able to subsidize the things that people care about and the things that provide them value. 
so uh, to take a step back, uh, when, when, uh, what's really happening in the Bitcoin network is that uh, a public good is being funded in a brand new way. So when you, when you think about what the new Bitcoins are funding, the, the more money that goes to the miners, the more secure the network is uh, by design. So what the, what the Bitcoin holders are funding is a public good that we can all share. Because when you use the Bitcoin network, it doesn't get any less secure for me. It's just as useful. Uh, so we've, uh, what we've seen over the last couple of years is a new public good funded in a brand new way. Uh, Bitcoin holders aren't giving away money to fund this public good. They're diluting their share of the Bitcoin supply and giving the new tokens to the people who secure the network. So, so that's really the breakthrough that's happened here over the past 10 years. It's not just that there's some fancy new currency, it's that since 2009, people have been outlandishly rewarded for subsidizing public goods. And if we can generalize that, uh, it's probably a pretty big deal. So to get an idea of uh, the economics of the system, uh, the, uh, if you think about uh, quarter four of 2019, the last quarter of last year, uh, there were about 2,500 coins spent in fees on the network. Uh, so that's really a small amount of what went to the miners because the inflation over the same period was 150,000 bitcoins. Uh, so if you compare that ratio, there's uh, a 60 times subsidy going to the miners of the network. Uh, and in the normal world, if you have a rich person who's trying to say, hey, I'm going to match your donations to fund this public good, they usually say, I'm going to give a dollar for every dollar you put in. So that's 2x, but what's happening on the Bitcoin network is 6x. Uh, and if we could take those same economics that are funding the security of this network and apply it to a different public good instead, again, that's probably a pretty big deal. Uh, so that's what we're trying to do here. That's what Panvala does. It takes the same Bitcoin model and applies it to communities. Uh, if you think about the quarter that ended on January 31st, uh, Panvala was matching at 11.2x. If you think about the quarter that ended on uh, May 1st, uh, that's, the, that's the first quarter that we did Gitcoin matching, and we matched at 12.9x. Uh, and if you think about this quarter that we just did, uh, we matched donations on Gitcoin grants at 4x. So the value of matching is fluctuating over time, but we believe that like Bitcoin, high levels of matching can be sustained for over a decade, and also that this matching can be shared by as many communities as want to use it. Because again, if it's matching as a multiple of what's coming in, if your community comes along and uses it alongside me, that doesn't make it any worse for me. Uh, it's matching my community's donations and subsidizing my community. At the same time, that's matching your community's donations and matching what you put in there. So what we think here is that we create an incredible decade-long window where any community in the world can have their contributions to public goods amplified at attractive rates. So if, you've, uh, if you're familiar with the story about how this Bitcoin network got up and running, there are all these mining firms getting established all over the world. They were trying to find the nooks and crannies with the cheapest electricity because there's some sort of hydroelectric dam nearby or something. They were trying to find the best chips that could mine most efficiently, and they were basically optimizing that public good. And if you think, if, if you imagine that the founder of Bitcoin, Satoshi Nakamoto, if he had decided to subsidize not security, but to subsidize communities, uh, what would that look like? I think it would look like uh, a lot of firms trying to optimize not security, but the satisfaction of communities. They'd be trying to fund the public goods that we've always kind of wanted, but couldn't find a way to fund and make sure that they were making the communities as fulfilled as they possibly could. Uh, so so that's what we're excited about. That's what we're trying to do. We think we can generalize that model to subsidize communities. Uh, beyond the economics of the system, if you want to get an idea of what that might look like uh, socially, I put together an essay called Cultivating Civic Life in Cyberspace. And the general idea behind that essay is uh, the, in, in America in particular, where I'm from, there, uh, there are stories about a threatening civic life in the past. Uh, an era where people were once members of civic associations, whether it's like a rotary club or maybe their local church, but all sorts of civic associations where people were actually uh, members. And uh, participation in these civic associations has gone down dramatically. And I don't think it's just because times have changed. I think it's an economic phenomenon. 
uh, governments have their national currencies that are really powerful at getting uh, work done. And corporations have equity that's really powerful at getting work done. But civic associations don't have economic tools that are on par with those things. They just bring in money and spend it out. But if we can give the civic sector of our society economic tools to compete, then maybe the civic sector of our society could be the most prominent one in our society. We wouldn't worry about the quarterly earnings as much. We wouldn't worry about winner-take-all uh, politics as much because we'd be able to fund within our own communities of people we choose. When our community doesn't do a thing that we like, we choose a different community uh, because it's a voluntary sector of our society. Uh, so that's kind of the idea here. Uh, if you're interested more about that, uh, the link to the essay is in there. I'll also share the link to this presentation in the chat in a second. Uh, so uh, if you've been paying attention to Bitcoin, you've probably seen a chart like this one where it uh, gives an overview of the inflation of Bitcoin and the supply of Bitcoin over time. You can see the, uh, uh, the supply of Bitcoin approach 21 million as time goes on. You can see the inflation start out high and approach zero as time goes on. And that's the same model that we're using in Panvala. So this chart is uh, Bitcoin and this chart is Panvala. So instead of 21 million, there's a maximum supply of 100 million and uh, it approaches that over time and the inflation goes down over time as we spend out uh, the tokens available to subsidize the system. Uh, so right now, the circulating supply of PAN is about 45 million. Uh, there's also the decaying supply of PAN. Uh, that's the PAN that's set aside and hasn't been released yet, but is released incrementally over time by the system. So there's 44.6 million PAN locked away. And there's also a reserved supply of 10 million PAN set aside by the system. Uh, that's kind of there in case the community has an opportunity to make some sort of deal that makes Panvala uh, grow a whole bunch. Uh, so since there's a, a kind of a fixed flow of tokens coming out of the system, if an opportunity came around for a deal, but you only have uh, the quarter's tokens to spend, you might not be able to make that deal. So instead, there's uh, tokens set aside up front just in case uh, they may not ever need to use those, but they're there just in case they can make a deal. Uh, so that's the general model of the PAN token. Uh, when you think about the maximum supply in the Bitcoin model, uh, that's a supply that's definitely reached, right? All those tokens are coming out and they're going to the miners no matter what. And the fees also go directly to the miners, not into the system. But in Panvala, donations go back into the system itself. When a donation is made in Panvala, the whole idea is that that's tokens going back into the token supply. And the reason that's important is because that means we can sustain the system indefinitely. There's always a budget for the system to govern because you can always govern the donation that came in. Uh, so instead of thinking of the uh, supply curve as a supply that's definitely going to happen, uh, really what's closer to what's going to happen is this red curve on this chart where there's uh, fluctuating amounts of donations coming in that really pushes down the circulating supply. The actual amount of tokens that's going around gets decreased by the donations. When you make a donation in Panvala, you're taking uh, PAN out of circulation and putting it back into the system so we can keep doing this thing forever. Uh, so uh, as I said before, like the, the tokens locked away are going to decrease over time. The amount of tokens coming out are going to decrease over time. So our ability to subsidize things with inflation is going to go down over time. Uh, for this quarter, uh, there's about 5.2 tokens coming out for every token that went in as donations. And if this is the stable equilibrium, uh, which I don't think it is yet, uh, it would decrease from here gradually over time. Uh, so we would start with an ability to match like 5x in 2030, it might go a little below 2x and so on. And we'd eventually go to 1x where there's one token going in for every one token going out. And we could do that indefinitely. But the point of Panvala is subsidies. Uh, right now, we're starting with this inflation subsidy and focusing on that because that's the new thing. But we don't want to run out of subsidy to be able to allocate. We always want to be uh, helping our communities work together to get subsidies from anywhere they possibly can. We start with the inflation subsidy, 
but we think that we can build up uh, corporate sponsorships over time. So in the end state of the system, it's not that there's no more subsidy, it's just that you replace the inflation subsidy with corporate subsidies. So if you think about something like a sports league, the individual teams can get their own sponsorships, but the league as a whole can get much larger sponsorships than they could get on their own. And similarly, it's common for civic associations to get corporate sponsorships, but we think that in the form of a league, they could work together to get much larger sponsorships than they could get on their own. So as the inflation subsidy decreases, we try to ramp up the corporate subsidies to replace it. So in the end state of the system where there's one token going in for every one token going out, uh, a small fraction of those are donations from the community members and a large fraction of those are donations coming in from corporate sponsors. Uh, so I'll stop there a second just to check if there's any questions and I'll also try to share the link to the slides. Hey, Nero, my, uh, my name is John Lattero. I'm the guy that was initially talking when I first uh, came on the um, Zoom. Um, I got a nonprofit organization that's performing arts based and, uh, and I want to use it. I want to use uh, money to provide scholarships to my youth that's participants in the organization. Um, and I saw this about, you know, Ethereum about matching and all that good stuff. And I want to figure out how can I use this to do uh, as such, you know? Um, right, so that sounds like it could be a good fit. Uh, the, for any community that is already uh, kind of familiar with how blockchains work and how to use them, uh, 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 it, the hard part is getting donors to donate in the, the currency. So if you have a community that can donate in cryptocurrency, then you're kind of great for the system and we should talk to get your community on board. Uh, really the, the hardest thing is that a lot of existing nonprofit efforts uh, don't uh, know anything about blockchains yet. So the, the focus has been getting blockchain focused uh, communities on board uh, and then going with uh, different technical com com communities out there who we think could easily start using blockchains. Uh, but if, if your community can send tokens on blockchain, you're a perfect fit. So we should definitely talk more about that. Yeah, I, I think what you said is because uh, cryptocurrency is still kind of new to a lot of people, you know, and, and that's the issue here. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, but eventually that'll be a problem. Uh, the, the goal is to like this this isn't supposed to be a system for just blockchain efforts. It's supposed to be for everybody. So like the the question isn't if uh, your community can be supported by this. It's really a when. Okay, so yeah, we'll talk more because we gotta figure out how to make it user friendly to everybody. So when I present it, you know, as far as raising money. Oh, how they can donate to the uh, my organization through the blockchain, right? Absolutely. Right. Any other questions? All right, I'll keep this going. So uh, during the latest round of donation matching, uh, we brought in 362,000 uh, tokens from donors. So there's about 78 donors and they donated 362,000 pan. There was uh, over 100 projects that received those donations. Uh, and then uh, quarterly, we uh, decide what to do with the budget of tokens that's released from the system. And we decided to set aside 75% of the budget, which ended up being 1.4 million pan. So we knew up front that the grantees were gonna receive 1.4 million pan because that's kind of fixed from the beginning. The question was what donations are gonna come in and that's what determines the multiplier. So we don't say, hey, we're gonna match donations at 4X. We say, hey, this many tokens are gonna to be distributed and then figure out how much the market decides things should be matched at. Uh, so that's generally how the system works. Uh, 360,000 uh, uh, in PAN came into donations and as a result, uh, 1 million PAN uh, will be matching uh, those donations. And that's coming from the dilution of the existing token holders. The new tokens are being created. People who already hold PAN, their share of the system is getting decreased by these new tokens. And that's what allows us to subsidize these communities. Uh, so uh, we have five communities right now. And the, uh, the way these communities get on 
and donation matching from the system is by uh, uh, holding on to tokens and uh, directing where their inflation goes. Because again, in Panvala, the idea is that holders are the philanthropists. Uh, the, 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 uh, it's basically a new form of philanthropy where instead of giving up uh, the masses of wealth that you've accumulated over time, instead you hold on to what you have and you dilute uh, your share of uh, that asset to be able to subsidize what you care about in your community. So it's the people who are staking tokens for their community that are the, the source of the matching and the people who aren't staking but are still holding on to tokens, they're the source of the matching as well. So the way these communities earn this matching capacity is by staking tokens. Uh, there's five communities right now and they take tokens to earn uh, donation matching capacity. Uh, the, the general idea is that we want each community to be able to be matched in proportion to the donations that they bring in. Uh, but uh, we also want each community to stake in proportion to the donations that they bring in. So that's why the staked tokens determine your uh, the staked tokens determine your community's capacity. Uh, so, uh, for an example, if your community has 10% of the skins and brings in 5% of the donations, then you're within your community's capacity. That means you're going to be matched at the highest available rate uh, uh, by the system. Uh, you bring more donations, you will still be matched at the highest available rate. Uh, what happens is that if you bring in too many donations, which is still good, uh, it's just that you need to stake more tokens to keep up. And if you don't stake more tokens to keep up, then you overflow your capacity. So if your community has 10% of the stake tokens and brings in 20% of the donations, you've exceeded your capacity. So that first 10% will be matched at the highest available rate, but then as you exceed your capacity, as that overflow increases, they'll be matched at lower and lower rates over time. Uh, so uh, what that means is that once you get above your capacity, you want to get people to stake more tokens so that you can maintain the highest rate. It's not to, it's not to punish anybody. It's just to maintain the relationship between the proportion of stake tokens and the proportion of donations coming into the system. So for a concrete example, we had these five communities this quarter. A uh, uh, common stack community staked 800,000 PAN and had 38% of the capacity of the system. Uh, the Meta Cartel community staked 90,000 PAN and had 4% of the capacity of the system. And then there were communities in between. And what happened is that they brought in different amounts of donations because that's the whole idea. Uh, there were three communities uh, that were within their capacity. So Hashing It Out, DAP Node, and DXDAO uh, were within their capacity. So that means that staking more tokens wouldn't do anything from the, for them uh, because they, are, uh, they hadn't brought in enough donations to need to stake more tokens. Uh, it's, it's not a system where we're just trying to get people to stake for no reason. It's just to maintain the relationship between the proportion of stake tokens and the proportion of donations. Uh, on the other hand, the Comstack community slightly exceeded their capacity, uh, so they had an overflow of 4%. So in stating the highest multiplier of 4.64, they ended up getting a slightly lower multiplier of 4.62. And all that means is that they could have staked a little bit more tokens and gotten uh, the highest available multiplier. Uh, Metacartel exceeded its capacity by 25%. So they had a multiplier of 4.41 instead of 4.64. That also means that they could have staked a little bit more tokens to get the highest multiplier for the system. Uh, so in general, the uh, total budget that we were able to allocate this quarter uh, was that 1.4 million PAN uh, going to those um, the grants on Gitcoin grants, and that was worth 55,000 this quarter, which is up 65% from the 33,000 that we allocated last quarter. Uh, that's exactly what we want to see. Uh, it's not guaranteed that that will continue to happen over time, but we hope that as we continue to grow the existing communities, get more of them to donate in PAN, and add more communities over time, that our ability to subsidize uh, communities increases. Uh, so for the individual projects that uh, got matching funds from the system, uh, it's useful to compare what they got from uh, Gitcoin, which has a matching budget from the Ethereum Foundation, and what they got from Panvala, which has a matching budget just from inflating the token supply. So on average, the Gitcoin projects were matched at 1.77x, and in Panvala, on average, the, uh, the projects were matched at 4x. So most projects got a higher match from Panvala in terms of the multiplier, 
but some projects got a higher match even in dollar terms from Panvala, which uh, is uh, impressive to me. Uh, really what we want people to understand is that when they're donating on Gitcoin each quarter, it's kind of a no-brainer to donate with PAN because it's matching at a higher rate and some of these projects are getting a higher value as a result. So uh, I talked a lot about staking tokens and holding on to the tokens to be a philanthropist in the system, uh, but grantees have a choice. Uh, not all of them can hold on to their tokens to be philanthropists in the system. Some of them need to pay their bills, and that's the whole point. We're trying to fund things that people care about, uh, so people are going to need to pay in Ether or dollars at the end of the day. Uh, so there's two main ways to do that right now. Uh, on Uniswap, uh, Uniswap is basically a program on the blockchain that holds some tokens, uh, some PAN tokens, and holds some Ether. So it's always trading. There's, you, you can always trade with Uniswap. It's just at whatever price the program gives you. Uh, the other way to exchange PAN is by using the Gnosis protocol, and that lets you set your own price rather than just taking whatever price the program gives you. So you can be on, on the Gnosis protocol, if you use a tool like Mesa, you can basically say, I want this many dollars for this many PAN, and your order will just sit there until somebody wants to actually trade at that value. Uh, so there's two ways to do it. Uh, if you just need to get a trade done, Uniswap is the best place to do it. And if you want to set your own price, the Gnosis protocol is the best place to do it uh, with a tool like Mesa. Uh, so uh, to see what's happened over time with the value of PAN, uh, I use a tool called CoinGecko. Uh, so you can look up the history of what it's been worth. Uh, one interesting pattern that's kind of come up over time uh, is if you notice in the Bitcoin world, there's new Bitcoins being created every 10 minutes, but the price isn't really affected every 10 minutes by those new Bitcoins because Bitcoin is very liquid at this point. People have been trading it for a decade. Uh, PAN is only moderately liquid at this point, so it's a lot more volatile than even Bitcoin is, which is extreme. Uh, so you can see swings around the quarterly releases of new tokens. So if you look on the chart, it's probably hard to see the dates, but uh, you can, the, the last releases were November 1st, January 31st, May 1st, and you can kind of see swings around uh, when that happens. Uh, the, goal, the hope is that over time, uh, when there's a pattern in the market, usually people trade to make that pattern go away. <laughs> so maybe there'll be less and less volatility over time as the system matures. Uh, but, right, but right now, that pattern seems to be there. So uh, we want you to get involved with Panvala, and there's a couple of ways to do that. Uh, the main way to get involved with Panvala isn't to get involved with Panvala directly, it's to get involved in one of the Panvala League's communities. So again, we have these five communities that are earning donation matching from Panvala, and if you join these communities, uh, you can be a part of what's happening there. So Comstack is a community of blockchain enthusiasts that are trying to create circular economies to fund public goods. Uh, DAPnode is trying to make sure that all users can conveniently host peer-to-peer uh, -peer clients to make sure that these systems that we were building can actually be decentralized. Uh, MetaCartel is trying to help uh, launch and grow DAOs, which are basically organizations that run on blockchains. Uh, DXDAO is trying to develop a DeFi ecosystem that's truly decentralized. And Hashing It Out is a podcast uh, that dives into the weeds of tech innovators and blockchain technology. These are our five uh, initial communities in the Panvala League. And the best way to get involved with Panvala is to join one of these communities and participate each quarter as they decide which projects they want to support with their matching capacity. Uh, the other way to get involved is to grow the Panvala League. So we have those five communities right now, but we want to grow from there. Uh, it's not necessarily growing more Ethereum-specific communities, but we want to grow beyond Ethereum-specific communities because, again, Panvala is for everybody. Uh, so we want to fill the Panvala League with uh, communities for all sorts of things to do. Uh, the metaphor that I use in my head is uh, like when you're a freshman on a college campus and you go to the student activities fair, there's a club for pretty much anything you could want to do, and we want Panvala to have a community for every kind of thing you would want to do. So again, one common kind of group on a college campus is like uh, the uh, cultural affinity groups that get created. So for instance, uh, like in, in the blockchain world, there are similar groups. So the blockchain world has like a woman in blockchain, uh, black in blockchain, Latino in blockchain, like it has all these uh, cultural affinity groups. 
and we'd create those, uh, bring those to the Panvala League and help subsidize the work that they're doing uh, with Panvala. There's also professional associations, so every kind of uh, work that people do, whether they're programmers, lawyers, project managers, et cetera, creating professional associations and subsidizing the work that they do. Uh, maybe subsidizing uh, communities for individual programming, programming languages that people use. Uh, on colleges, there's intramural sports, but since we're building duly native uh, civic association, it's hard to do sports in person. So esports uh, might be a good angle for people to be able to create communities around the people that they play with regularly and so on. Uh, we want to fill the Manbala League with all sorts of things to do. And if you have an, uh, an existing community that you want to bring to Panvala or an idea for a community that you'd like to create and grow within Panvala, we want to help you do that. And the last way to get involved with Panvala is to help govern Panvala. Uh, so Panvala is controlled by its tokens. And if you have PAN tokens and you want to steer where Panvala goes, uh, we want to help you do that. So the way that governance works in Panvala is that there's a restriction in the smart contracts that uh, there's going to be one budget proposal each quarter that gets executed. And the re, uh, there's a lot of other systems uh, in the blockchain world that basically uh, allow many proposals to be going at the same time, and they all uh, are voted on independently. Uh, the reason we introduced this restriction is to kind of force people to form groups uh, in the real world and discuss with each other what they should do each quarter. So it's not kind of like a uh, independent proposals live on their own kind of system. It's a let's meet up each quarter and decide what we want to do together kind of system. Uh, so the Panvala Caucus is the group that we formed to do that. Uh, and uh, each quarter we kind of discuss what uh, we want to recommend to the token holders to do. Uh, we publish that recommendation in the forum. Uh, we take in feedback and then we submit that recommendation to the smart contracts. Uh, now the uh, broader community of PAN holders uh, if, if we're out of line with what they want, uh, they can always make their own proposal. Anybody can make their own proposal on chain. It's just that only one of them is going to go through. And you have to stake tokens on your proposal to make one. So if you make a proposal and you say, hey, this is the consensus of the Panvala community, and it's not actually the consensus of the Panvala community, you're going to lose your tokens. Uh, there's going to be a vote triggered once there's that second proposal in the system. And then the uh, winning proposal gets executed. All the losing proposals don't get executed, and they lose the tokens that were staked on them. So you're kind of there's this financial incentive to not be crazy, to not go off the rails. You want to be in line with what the community actually wants. And if you're wrong, you're going to lose the tokens that you staked on your proposal. Uh, so if you're familiar with Ethereum, uh, you can think of the Panvala caucus as Panvala's version of the of the Ethereum core devs. So periodically, the core devs try to put together a recommendation for what should go into the next fork. They write up the code, and then they hand it off to the miners. But the miners in the network don't have to run that new code. They can accept or reject the recommendations of the Ethereum core devs. And similarly, uh, the Panvala caucus makes recommendations that the token holders can accept or reject. So you can join the caucus if you have PAN tokens and you want to work with us to make recommendations each quarter. Uh, send us an email and we'll start the process to get you on board. Uh, there's a quiz and then there's an entry interview and then you get to join the 25 of us who are currently doing this each quarter and we'd love to have you be a part of that. Uh, so get involved. We want you to be part of Panvala. Uh, we think that we can help grow the civic sector of our society. We can do more of our work together on a voluntary basis rather than in winner-take-all politics or in corporations that are focusing on the next earnings report, uh, we think we can grow the civic sector and subsidize it the same way that Bitcoin is subsidizing its security, uh, hopefully at a larger rate than can be done in traditional ways. Uh, so if you're excited about making that happen, we want you to be a part of this thing, and we want to keep growing communities that are being subsidized by Panvala. Uh, if anybody has any questions, uh, I'd love to answer them. Uh, I, I have a question. Um, so I, I, I've been, where would you say is the best place to like stay up to date on conversations? Is it the, the Panvala forum uh, or there, or there like Slack or Discord 
that also has uh, community members? Uh, so we have a Telegram group uh, that uh, is kind of like the, the place where people are asking the most questions right now. It's not super high traffic. Uh, the, if you're trying to keep up with what's going on in Panvala, the best thing to do is to sign up for the forum because then you'll get an email for all the forum posts. And that's where most of the like uh, kind of uh, quarterly budgets get discussed, uh, the, the plans for each quarter. Those get published in the forum, so you'll hear what's happening uh, through the emails from that. Um, but right now, like really, the 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 structure of Panvala is oriented around the communities that plug into it. So it's really uh, like I think about it less as a Panvala community and more of it as a group of Panvala communities because the Panvala communities are the uh, the, the communities in the league. So if you want to keep up with what's happening with Panvala. Uh, Signing up for the forum is really the best way to do that, uh, but being involved in one of the five communities is an even better way. Awesome, thank you. I have a question. So um, for the caucus to govern Panvala, um, with Giveth2, we've set up a DAO to govern and fund development of the Giveth2 DAP, Giveth DAP. And um, after this latest Panvala matching round will have a decent number of Panvala tokens. Would it be possible for a DAO to be a member of the caucus? And if so, what would that application process look like? Uh, so uh, we've, we've never done that before, but if, uh, if you guys want to do that, we could try to figure that out. Um, like the, um, the general model that we've had so far is to have representatives of each community be involved because we still have to have like somebody to talk to at the end of the day. Um, and then there's within the Panvala caucus, it's not really like a system, it's, it's not an organization where we vote regularly. Uh, the, the, the general model within the caucus is more like the Linux development model, where it's kind of like uh, the, like in Linux, there's Linus Torvald, the guy who founded the thing. Uh, there's the lieutenants that he appoints to be like maintainers of different uh, parts of the system and so on. Like they, they don't vote on what to do with Linux. They just uh, exit if something terrible happens. So in, Panvala, in the Panvala caucus, it's the same sort of structure. So I kind of lead the caucus. I try to get feedback from the people within the caucus. And then if I do stuff that people don't like, uh, the, the actual smart contracts on chain don't have me in them at all. <laughs> so you can always go directly to the smart contracts. And that's kind of the model that we have. So it, it's less meaningful for a DAO to be a member of the Panvala caucus because it's a group for people to discuss. So it's really like the discussion can only happen between people. Uh, but a, um, like we're definitely interested in having DAOs be communities within the Panvala League. That to me makes a ton of sense because it's less about talking with the caucus members about what to do. And it's more about subsidizing what the community around the DAO wants to do. And that makes tons of sense. Well, maybe that's the, the better approach, but definitely some good yeah. stuff to think about. W Willie, that's a, that's a really good like question and idea because we're actually, the whole DAO space is trying to figure this out is like, can, first of all, can DAOs be members of DAOs? Cause there's going to be like DAO ch parents and DAO child. And then also can DAOs be member of groups? And so the Pamela caucus is a group. And like, so if you want the DAO to be a member, how do you like set that up and how do you structure it that like it works within a group, right? And, it, and the answer to that is not solved. And so, but I think eventually it will be, it's, it's a little easier when you say DAOs being members of DAOs, but DAOs being member of, members of groups, which is what this is, is the same challenge. And I think it will happen, but I don't think there's a good answer right now. So that's why it's really difficult. <laughs> right, and the, the reason I ask is that the DAO holds all the tokens, so. Maybe we could, like, if we were to take that route, we could have the DAO elect a representative, and then that's the that's the human that in, engages in the discussions. Um, but yeah, I think it's a it's an unsolved problem, um, and not something we have to solve on this call. But I think it's something worth exploring potentially. Definitely seems like it could be cool and could make sense. But I think Naran's got a good point that maybe what would make more sense is taking the community approach, which could also be something that we're interested in. And there's also already DAOs that stake tokens in the system. So DAOs can definitely stake 
It's just uh, when it comes to the uh, conversation focus groups, like it's hard to talk to a DAO. <laughs> uh, it's easy to talk to a person. Totally. Well, thank you for the answer. Any other questions? All right. Uh, thanks so much, everybody, for coming and taking the time to learn about what's going on with the system. Uh, we've been live for almost a year now. August 22nd is going to be the first anniversary of the launch of the system. And it's come a long way since, the, the, uh, since we were originally launched. Uh, I, I think at this point, it's really clear what's going on with the system. We've matched donations at attractive rates for multiple quarters in a row. And we're at a point where we really need to spread the word. Uh, when people are donating on Gitcoin grants, we want them to donate with PAN so they can earn more matching. Uh, when people are creating communities that are full of blockchain enthusiasts and other people who have private keys, we want to help them organize on a basis where they can earn subsidies from the system. Because at the end of the day, we think that we can subsidize any community that wants to be a part of the system and they can share the system together. Uh, we can uh, help kick off an era where there's more and more cooperation happening on a voluntary basis with the system. And I'm really excited for more and more of you to be a part of what's happening here. I think this is a really big deal. And if you agree, I, I hope to see more of the impact that you're going to make on what we do in this community and on what we do with the system. Uh, so thanks, everybody. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Niran. Is there a pin yeah. ball apart? <laughs> uh, what, what do you mean? Isn't there like an anniversary party or something? Oh uh, yeah, so I'm trying to figure out what to do with that. If people have ideas of how to celebrate Panvala Day, uh, I'm definitely interested in uh, uh, people's ideas for that. Um, if like a, there's a video of the launch day like um, uh, on our uh, YouTube channel, if you're interested in that, like I kind of gave a talk when we were launching the thing and we hit the button live. Uh, so if you're interested in uh, viewing that, that's up on YouTube. I don't know how to necessarily commemorate that. I'm going to try to come up with ideas, but I'd love to hear ideas that people have about how to do that. Cool. All right, all right. Hey, uh, are you guys on uh, social media? Yes. Uh, uh, the other best way to keep up with us, which I should have mentioned, is our Twitter account. Uh, we're Panvala HQ on Twitter. Uh, that's where that's basically our primary channel for reaching out to people. Uh, so following us on Twitter is a great idea. So yeah, I just googled you on uh, well, I just searched for you on Facebook. Now um, you pulled up in the group I'm in called Black People and Cryptocurrency. Somebody made a yeah, somebody made a, a, a yeah a YouTube video. Okay, I see you with the uh, talking at a February 2019 East Denver event. Okay. Oh, interesting. Yeah, somebody pulled, yeah, somebody made a post. Um, right. Slate governance for effective token votes. Yep. So that was a talk about the governance model that we use in Panvala. It's kind of different than most systems. So uh, that talk was about like how it's different and why. Uh, so yeah, uh, if you're interested in diving deeper into the governance model of the system, that's definitely a good video. Okay, no, no, most definitely. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Cool. Uh, well, thanks so much, everybody. Thanks again for taking the time and looking forward to working more closely with all of you to make this thing happen. Yes, sir. Bye, everyone. Bye. Yes.